Hello and welcome to a History Film Forum discussion of How the Monuments Came Down, a film by Hannah Ayers and Lance Warren that explores the history of monuments to the slaveholders' rebellion in Richmond, Virginia, and the Black resistance to white supremacy that worked to begin to bring them down. My name is Christopher Wilson. I'm Director of Experience Design at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. And I want to thank our partners at Smithsonian Associates, Field Studio Films, and Dan Manad and Democracy Films for the support that makes this program possible. When we decided to launch these History Film Forum online discussions in 2021 to explore film as public history, some of the first people we reached out to were Hannah Ayers and Lance Warren. We had the pleasure of premiering their film in an Outrage, which looked at the history and legacy of lynching in the United States at the 2017 History Film Forum. When we spoke late last year, I learned of this important project to explore this issue of monuments in Richmond that is about so much more than statues and about so much more than the experience of one city. How the Monuments Came Down airs on the World Channel on September 15th, 2021 at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Check your lo local listings. And also streams on pbs.org beginning on September 8th. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator for this discussion, Madupe Labode, curator at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. Well, hello. My name is Madupe Labode. I'm a curator at the National Museum of American History, and I work in two divisions, the Division of Political and Military History and Cultural and Community Life. My area of specialty is African-American social justice history. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you here to a discussion about an important new film, How the Monuments Came Down, which really takes us into Richmond, Virginia, and the story about Confederate monuments, uh, both locally and nationally. We have a wonderful panel here today, and I'd like to introduce the panelists before we get started. So Hannah Ayers and Lance Warren are the filmmakers. So Hannah Ayers is a native of Charlottesville, Virginia and attended the College of William and Mary and Columbia University. She supported fundraising and communication at Witness, a human rights at video advocacy organization. Lance Warren was raised in Virginia and studied at Syracuse University and Brandeis University. He supported the work of the, at the, of the Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History in various ways, including producing online courses and virtual field trips. Hannah Ayers and Lance Warren are married and in partners in Field Studios. In their words, the Field Studio makes story-driven media at the intersection of history and social justice. Field Studios is behind a wonderful public television series, The Future of America's Past, which won a Capitol Emmy in 2020. Their other films include That World is Gone, Race and Displacement in a Southern Town, and An Outrage, which is about lynching in the US South. Our next panelist is Christy Coleman, who is the Executive Director of the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation in Williamsburg, Virginia. Prior to her assuming that post, she, assumed she served 12 years as the CEO of the American Civil War Museum. In Richmond, um, she did something remarkable in that post, she oversaw the merger of several museums, including the American Civil War Center and the Museum of the Confederacy. She also was the co-chair of the Monument Avenue Commission appointed by Richmond Mayor LeVar Stoney. Her previous experience includes, includes serving as the director of African-American interpretation at Colonial Williamsburg and as the director of the Charles H. Wright Museum in Detroit. She received her bachelor's and master's degree at Hampton University. Michael Paul Williams, our next, our next panelist, is a native of Richmond. He attended Virginia Union, University and Medill School of Journalism at Northwestern and has worked at the Richmond Times Dispatch since 1982. First as a reporter and then in, I'm sorry, he worked at the Richmond Times Dispatch since 1982 first as a reporter and since 1992 as a columnist, the first black person to be a columnist at that newspaper. He has held a fellowship, numerous prestigious awards, including the Nyman Fellowship at Harvard and received a Will Rogers Humanitarian Award from the National Society of Newspaper Columnists. 
And in June 2021, he won the Pulitzer Prize for Commentary. I'd just like to quote the commendation. For the award was for penetrating and historically insightful columns that guided Richmond, a former capital of the Confederacy, through the painful and complicated process of dismantling the city's monuments to white supremacy. So thank you all for coming today and welcome. I'd like to start off with our first questions to Lance and Hannah, because you have a long history with the National Museum of American History. During the 2017 History Film Forum, when your film An Outrage premiered, you also participated in our Emerging Filmmakers Lab, which offered resources to filmmakers looking to tell historical stories on the screen. We feel it's important to support and broaden the work behind the camera to fully, resume, re fully represent our past in film. When telling a crucial story of Black resistance to white supremacy, such as in this film, can you describe your process and commitment to combating issues of privilege and access to diverse storytelling? Sure, sure. Thank you, Dupe. And thank you to everyone who's here, to Christy, to Michael, to the History Film Forum, the Smithsonian. We're really grateful for the opportunity, as you say, Dupe, to again come and, and present a film um, under this banner. I, I think the start of our process this year, last year in 2020 was just realizing the historical moment that we were in. Uh, when the protests began here following the murder of George Floyd, the protests in Richmond really coalesced around Monument Avenue, which for people who are not uh, from Richmond is, is this sort of grand boulevard in the heart of the city lined with um, mostly statues to Confederates. And this is where the, the protests in many ways were, were centered and were pulsing in, in the early days and, and weeks. We were living three blocks from Monument Avenue at that time. We live in Richmond. And it was striking to us that what we were seeing was on the one hand, an expression of contemporary protest, but also, and harder I think for a lot of people to see, part of a long legacy of black resistance to white supremacy here and across the nation but a reality here that, that has been uh, overshadowed in many ways by the Confederacy and the lost cause myths and its descendants for decades and generations. And we were struck too that in that moment, right, you, you had people expressing, however briefly, however maybe disingenuously, expressing their statement that, yeah, Black Lives Matter, yeah, Black History Matters. We thought, well, maybe there's a moment however fleeting it'll be, when people will be willing to listen to that broader story, when people would be willing to listen and engage in a story about Black liberation, could we use that opportunity to reach out to people we know, people like Christy, people like Michael, who know this story, who've been present in telling this story in various ways in public history and journalism, could we reach out to people who know the story well and ask them to help us tell that, to really marshal the moment and work hard to try to get that film out a year later when maybe, if we're being really hopeful, people might look back at that summer and say, what, what did it all mean? What should it all mean? And so I, I think the first part of our process was just kind of realizing the, the historical nature uh, of what was such a fiery contemporary moment and then reaching out to past colleagues and, and people we, we had come to admire, uh, building a team that looked like the story and, and working to, to tell that story uh, from, from the ground up. And we feel very fortunate to have the support of, of VPM to uh, be able to launch into this project. And, you know, something we think about a lot is how can we leverage our privilege and our access to elevating stories and elevating voices of people who have been doing this work, who have lived experiences, whose voices may not otherwise be elevated. So we're very intentional about, um, as I said, our, our hiring, our team, our process, the, the process of making the film to us is just as important as the final product. And um, the, the you know, topics that you mentioned about access to, to making films, about equity and inclusion, or something we think about a lot and have been engaged in conversations about for several years. And we're encouraged that it seems that the documentary filmmaking community, um, you know, there's been a lot of internal conversations, but mm -hmm. now there's even more pressure on funders and distributors to think not only about who is telling these stories, but also let's make sure the staff people and the board members of these organizations that are making these 
uh, opportunities possible, but they also reflect a, a diverse uh, cross section of, of Americans. So um, this is something we, we care deeply about and are thinking about often. I think that comes through in the, the process comes through in the documentary itself, that it is multi-layered, that it isn't just kind of, um, you know, a story about that, that we may have read about. But for many people who are watching this have not been to Richmond or have not seen Monument Avenue. And I just like to say a little bit about it. It was, it's a very, as Lance mentioned, it's a very long uh, boulevard. It's, um, it was designed as is discussed in the documentary to be a beautiful street. And in that understanding of beauty, there also were, enormous monuments on it. Um, so from 1890 to 1929, there were five monuments um, that were monuments to Confederate Confederate leaders and, um, and figures that were important to the Confederacy. Um, so just to give us a sense of this, since you are all, all of you know Richmond extraordinarily well, I'd like to get a sense of how you felt when you first kind of recognized what Confederate, what, what it meant to have these enormous Confederate monuments on this main street, main um, avenue. And if you've had changing views on the, uh, on Monument Avenue since, the, since um, your first encounters with it or the encounters you remember. So uh, Michael, you are an, a Richmond native. So I was wondering if you could uh, tell us a little bit about how your ideas about Monument Avenue have, have changed or what you, what you first thought when you encountered it. Growing up in Richmond, uh, I guess my tact as a child and well into young adulthood was to somewhat pretend that Monument Avenue and its monuments did not exist in any meaningful way in my life. And that wasn't hard to do. Um, Richmond of my childhood was very segregated and um, Monument Avenue was a pass through zone, uh, not a place for us to really spend a lot of time to occupy. It was uh, uh, something we had to cross from get to point A to point B. Uh, I did not spend any significant time on Monument Avenue until I was an adult. Uh, I think I was maybe in my early 30s when I attended my first Easter parade. Um, the most time I ever spent on Monument Avenue was during the, um, a very popular 10K race uh, that's held every spring where we would walk or as I did on one occasion, actually run the 10K race and kind of pretend that the monuments don't exist or didn't exist. Um, so there was kind of an acquiescence to Monument Avenue because uh, it wasn't something, um, obviously, that someone like myself was wild about, but what could you do about it? That um, began to evolve, began to become more mindful of Monument Avenue um, after Arthur Ashe's death. Um, when myself and others, such as L. Douglas Wilder, um, the former governor, and Chuck Richardson, um, the former city council member began advocating for the inclusion of a, a statue to Arthur Ashe on Lyman Avenue, and that would have been in the, the mid 1990s. And the thought then was to have diversified a street, mm. um, that perhaps we could um, change its energy and maybe remove some of the negative power if we could make the story that was being told there more inclusive. Uh, that turned out to be, um, I don't want to say misguided, but it didn't happen. And at some point, I would say for me, um, immediately after the murder of nine folks in Charleston, South Carolina, during a Bible study by a white supremacist, uh, I just came to the immediate conclusion that this could no longer work and the monuments had to go. Oh, thank you. Um... Christy, how, what were your views on Monument Avenue? Right, well, I mean, I grew up 50 miles down the road, right, from Richmond. And so the community that I grew up in was, you know, steeped in the Revolutionary War. So to drive 50 miles and then have this, you know, um, homage to the Confederacy so rampant 
um, was really quite interesting. It was, it was sort of, um, for me, I didn't really encounter them until I was in my early 20s, you know, when I was coming to Richmond to hang out with friends or whatever, and would like, like Michael would have to pass through them, but I was struck by their, the massiveness of them. And, and frankly, at that time, I just found them absurd and funny. Um, I didn't think about the harm of them until I got older and I started thinking about even my own elementary school was named after a Confederate general in Williamsburg. And I started thinking about just how pervasive that was and, and you know, the, the, the certain level of, of greater awareness of the subtle and not so subtle messages that were even included in our uh, statewide curriculum around you know slavery as a benign institution and you know the confederacy was only a constitutional question uh, regarding states versus federal rights and all of this nonsense that you know the more i became aware of the history and digging into it you know it was pretty they were very clear they were very adamant what they were why they were starting then this that nation right and so it just seemed to me odd that this was allowed to exist in such a powerful way in the, in the city of Richmond. And, and then once I moved to Richmond back in 2008, after having been in Detroit and Baltimore and other places, and I moved to Richmond to run the Civil War Museum, the Civil War Center at that time, um, I really got an understanding of just how deep and pernicious it was um, because it wasn't, you know, the, the focus on the four years really misses the point. There was a buildup and then there was an aftermath. And that aftermath of, of Jim Crow and how it played out in Richmond once the leash was off the South after reconstruction, um, that to me was where the, the real harm was, was coming. Mm. Um, the, the, um, and the thing is, you know, Richmonders pride themselves on a politeness. So that was one of the other things that I think is really fascinating to me, watching events unfold, not just in 2020, because there had been other protests in the city around the monuments, you know, um, I, I, I was not in Richmond at the time, or was I? Yeah, yeah, I, I wasn't living in Richmond, but I heard about the, the flood walls going up and banners to Robert E. Lee and, and kids running around and throwing Molotov cocktails at them. So this was not a new thing. This wasn't just, um, oh, everybody got upset after 2015. Mm -hmm. You know, there'd been resistance to these images. And, you know, it was almost like, we'll let y'all have Monument Avenue because, you know, most of us can't afford to live over there and don't want to, you know, live in the museum district. We'll let y'all have that, but you start spreading that foolishness throughout our city, we got a problem. And that's kind of how I perceived it, right? Um, so I think that that's, you know, for those who say, oh, we were fine before then. No, we weren't. It's just the voices got louder and the voices became more insistent that there is no coexistence with these kinds of symbols. And they are not history. They're myth-making. And um, so from that, I think, yeah, I... I you know, processed it a lot. Thank you. Um, Hannah and Lance, what are, how, how are your encounters with Monument Avenue? You know, I, I lived in Richmond in my early childhood uh, until I was eight. Uh, my family lived in uh, the West End suburbs of Richmond. Uh, my father graduated from Virginia Commonwealth University, a major city, a major university here in Richmond. Uh, when I was a kid, it's the one memory I have as a young child even being in the city of Richmond. So I, I don't have any kind of memory of Monument Avenue uh, pre, pre eight, uh, but I, I moved back here uh, seven years ago, um, obviously as an adult. And though I was aware of the existence of Monument Avenue, I, I was, kind of flabbergasted by its reality. Um, you know, I had by then spent time in, in major cities and seen massive monuments to other people and, and ideas. And uh, they're certainly not always uh, monuments, uh, agreeable things, but the fact of what these monuments were celebrating, the centrality of them in the city, 
and the casual embrace of them, the, the deep-seated embrace that, that Christy talks about, but also the, the, the casual way that they were folded into everyday life, the Easter parade that, that Michael mentioned, the, the 10K run. I found that kind of breathtaking um, and disturbing. And I also didn't see them going anywhere anytime soon. Um, I, I, they, they seemed immovable. Um, they seemed deeply regrettable, something that I wasn't comfortable being around and didn't want to take part in, didn't take part in those community events that were centered there. Uh, but they also seemed um, oddly immovable in a city that's ostensibly progressive, if you look at election returns, but was obviously regressive in, in, in the inertia that, that it allowed to exist on that avenue. And I grew up in Charlottesville and uh, remember going to Lee Park and uh, attending, you know, festivals that were uh, around the, the Robert E. Lee statue there and um, really didn't think much of it. And, and it wasn't until we moved here from Brooklyn, <clears throat> we had lived on Douglas Street, Douglas with two S's named for Frederick Douglas. And then we moved to the corner of Davis Street in Richmond. And named for Jefferson Davis. Right. So that <clears throat> that contrast really um, did you know start opening my eyes. But like Lynn said, it, you know, it, it didn't occur to me that we would see them come down, at least not in the, the coming years. And um, they have been such a, a backdrop. And I think you know, one thing we encountered in doing interviews was. Um, plenty of white residents in Richmond just never thought much of them and never thought that they were a symbol of, of harm or hate and thought they were pretty or that they just were kind of in the background and not, not doing anyone any harm. I really appreciate you all sharing your encounters and how these have changed because I think that as people have been either called to account or called to reconsider monuments in their own their own uh, neighborhoods and communities there's been a range of things and clearly monument avenue is um it's just sounds so monumental that sounds cliched but i think um as you're building up this this uh portrait of how people have either tried to evade it or tried to protect themselves from it or their ideas have been caused to change um, so the, the documentary itself, I think, really makes some really important historical arguments and, you know, mobilize a lot of evidence about um, challenges to the monuments and challenges to white supremacy before that go back even further. And one of the things that I found so fascinating was this really robust portrait that was emerging of Richmond's Black community dating from basically kind of the settlement of Richmond as a, it's a center where there is slave, in slavery of Black people and displacement of Indigenous people. Um, Christy, I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about the, like, what makes Richmond's Black community, kind of dating from the industrial roots of the city, um, significant and why, how, how it's formed challenges to anti-Black activism in its midst. That's really interesting. So, you know, the, um, by the 1630s, um, Africans are in the area of Richmond. It was called Henricus, All right, Today that's Henrico County, which is a, a immediate uh, adjacent county to the city proper. And, and of course the, the state capital moves from Williamsburg to uh, Richmond in 1690, I'm sorry, 1799. And so what happens during that period is, is really, really interesting because you, know, you do have a lot of farms and plantations. There's still a relatively large indigenous population around the outskirts of Richmond. But Richmond will soon manifest, especially after the US um, government passes legislation to end um, the importation of Africans, right? So a different trade establishes itself, a trade that's internal. 
And what happens very quickly, Virginia is, you know, tobacco isn't doing as much. Virginia is basically providing provisions and, you know, wheat and various foodstuffs and things of that sort. Richmond hasn't quite become an industrial place yet by, by 1808. Um, you know, it's still relatively rural. It is the capital. So there's a lot of business interests that are in the city. Um, and with that, there are a lot of domestic slaves um, that are working in the households and in these businesses and, and things of that sort. But the opportunity with all of this enslaved labor to provide labor to places further south, um, because now there are after 1803 in the Louisiana Purchase, there are now lands to the south. Louisiana, Alabama, et cetera. And they need, want enslaved labor for cotton, right? So Virginia, Richmond in particular, becomes the second most uh, prolific, profitable um, slave trading port behind New Orleans. It's been estimated that 40% of all Americans of African descent um, had an ancestor that was transported from Richmond to the deep south, down river to the south. So that, you know, and, and the thing is that section of Richmond is to the east in the valley, the area called Shaco, Shaco Bottom, Shaco Valley, all of that was, there was basically, I think it was like um, 40 square blocks or 20, I'm sorry, 20 square blocks with 40 different auction houses, the hotels, the businesses that provided the clothing and the food to, to, for these slaves to be bought and sold and transferred and what have you, hotels for the buyers and sellers. I mean, it was an entire enterprise. That is where the wealth of Richmond really took off. Um, there was a study done of, I think it was the Amahandro, uh, the, the, the Amahandro uh, slave auction house where one year did something like $4 million in sales in the 1850s, 1860s. Mm. That's an outrageous yeah. amount of money, right? And so that's what Richmond is born on. I'll never forget when I moved to Richmond uh, and I met with one of the, the philanthropic and business leaders in the city, uh, he said to me coming in, he said, I want you to know that there are two things about Richmond that you need to understand. It was built on two lies. The first lie was slavery was good for black people. And the second lie was tobacco won't kill you. And both were intertwined. Mm. And I have never mm. forgotten him saying that because essentially that's what happened. So there's always been a population of, of African descended black people in and about Richmond, doing a variety of work as the city did become more industrialized. They're involved in skilled trades. There are free black peoples. There are people in the households. There are people on the outskirts in the counties of Hanover and Gooseland and other places. Um, and so it is. It, there is a constant movement and a desire to control um, the lives and, and of, of those people in every conceivable way. And so it's, it's just built into the fabric of what Richmond was and what Richmond is. And, and then again, that desire to control. And, and, and see, so, so here's the thing, when you, um, because they, this idea of dehumanizing black people, that slavery was good for them, you know, oh, you know, we've heard it, you know, gave them God. Right, they already had God. What are you talking about? Right, so I mean, there's all these things that to to dehumanize Black people to make the inhumanity done to them acceptable, and so as a result, when there is Black freedom and having to rework not only a religious framework, a political framework, and a social framework, becomes very difficult for the people who were pressing this idea of white supremacy and slavery is the rightful thing. And oh, eventually we'll get them to freedom once we get them fully civilized. And it's just all kinds of foolishness. Um, and that permeates through Richmond's history mm. into the 20th century. I mean, good God, we had, Richmond had the, the Racial Integrity Act of 1924 that basically said, you're either white or you're not, right? I mean, it. it that, and, and it, it is not unique 
to necessarily to Richmond. This is, these are things are found throughout the South. And, and to some degrees in Northern cities as well, these practices. And I think that Racial Integrity Act, just to clarify, Virginia has a very large indigenous population. And basically what it said is that you need to decide, well, or be decided for you, I believe that- Decided you, for you. For you. It was decided for you. That you're white or you're black. The idea of a kind of much more multi, you know, a multifaceted society, Virginia had the kind of temerity to try to legislate it out of existence. Exactly, exactly. And um, I think it's an example, one of the arguments I think that's being made in the film is that, um, that white supremacy, that racism is not um, ancient or backwards, it is very adaptable and very, can keep up with streetcars and interstate highways and whatever the kind of most modern thing is. Um, so I wanna just shift a little bit to the monuments itself. And like, and Hannah and Lance, you interview several historians who talk about the, um, the ladies of the Confederacy, as they, ladies is what they call themselves, um, who in the kind of initially were respond, who were really the driving motivator for many of the, for these um, first mourning, the people they called the Confederate dead, and then also helping transform the idea of the Confederacy beyond um, from treason to a respectable enterprise. And these monuments in, in Monument Avenue are part of that. I wonder if you could say, if you could kind of give us a little bit of a taste of what you, discuss in your film. Sure, sure. Well, and one of the historians who talks about that is Christy. Um, so one thing that she says in the film is that a, a key difference between the, the Union and Confederate armies, that is the, the armies of the United States and, and the, the would-be Confederate States of America, is that the United States Army has a system of uh, burial, uh, national cemeteries for that purpose, some 70 some of these cemeteries where soldiers who've fallen in battle are buried and not always immediately, right? This is part of the story of the Gettysburg Address is that there are many corpses laying in the field and, and there, there's a, a massive effort to, to organize and inter them. The Confederacy did not have a system like that. And so even after the war ends, there are many bodies just still simply laying in the fields. And Christy explains that ladies associations uh, start up uh, initially to, to actually deal with that uh, gruesome reality to, to collect bodies and to give them burials. Uh, Caroline Janney, another historian in the film, uh, notes that often the, the, the uh, emphasis was on sort of proper Christian burials, uh, that there were also Hebrew lady, ladies associations representing Jewish soldiers um, who had fallen in the war. And this is really how it, how it began. And, over the course of the early years of Reconstruction, Reconstruction started sooner in Virginia than it did elsewhere. It also ended sooner. Uh, it was well over by the time of 1877, this year that we teach in our textbooks about when Reconstruction had ended, that the dream of what that could mean in Virginia had long passed at that point. But over those early years of Reconstruction, you have it coming to pass that these cemeteries where Confederate soldiers are being honored as fallen husbands and brothers and friends are becoming spaces of political commentary, spaces to make arguments about a, a Richmond, about a Virginia, in which possibilities for Black liberation uh, were to many white Southerners feeling dangerously possible. Uh, that they could see what so many generations of Virginians and Americans missed. That in fact, uh, it wasn't as simple as slavery ended and then there was this time of Jim Crow when black people were this passive oppressed group and then Dr. King had a dream and boy, things have been getting good ever since. That the reality is that there was a tremendous amount of self-determination of running for and getting elected to public office, of education, of family reunification, which is one of the most powerful uh, aftermaths of the war as, as Black families strive to stitch themselves back together from the separations of war and enslavement. There's a tremendous amount of community building and mobilization and political action that is, that is taking place. And this is 
threatening to white Southerners who had just been militarily defeated. Um, and so we, we, see, uh, we see a situation in which ladies associations, indeed, as you said, uh, as, as they call themselves, spring up to, to do the, the initial uh, sort of necessary work of, of interring fallen bodies and how these organizations, uh, in part uh, with women themselves and, and increasingly with uh, Confederate soldiers who, through the separation of time, are kind of uh, reasserting themselves on, on the stage, are, are turning these efforts into something that uh, is altogether uh, more insidious and indeed, as Christy said, reflective of the emerging Jim Crow realities of a place like Richmond. I think one thing that really stood out to me was, you know, upon the death of, of Robert E. Lee, there's uh, very quickly mobilization to consider what kind of monument or memorial would be uh, put in place and that the Ladies Memorial Associations, um, you know, start fundraising, not only locally, not only in Virginia, but throughout the South, and that there's this um, massive effort to raise enormous sums of money to, you know, hire sculptors who've been trained in Europe, and, um, and in the process, you know, they are crafting this narrative, and they're teaching their children, and, and you know, contributing to these um, you know, educational narratives about what the uh, what the South was fighting for, and that these are the heroes that we need to to hold dear. And I think that one of the things that comes clear is that if you grew up in the United States and are say you know over a certain age, maybe thirty is that you were very much kind of educated about an idea of that the South and the North were equitable, that they weren't really, um, that I, I grew up definitely in my uh, high school and even some early college education had the, I were taught by people who had in turn been taught that the civil, that slavery was, wasn't necessarily the cause. And so I think when people talk about this as a Southern issue, they need to really think about how national, how powerful this, what this narrative has been nationally. Um, this, this documentary makes me very excited about like how I think that people will watch it, will learn about people like John Mitchell and they'll learn about Maggie Lena Walker. Um, but um, I'm gonna resist my impulse of going by person by person and let you all discover how amazing these people are. And if you haven't heard of them and others kind of reflect on how you may have been cheated from that in your education. Um, and I'd like to turn to something that is a real turning point in, in Richmond. So we're jumping straight ahead into the 70s. And um, this is the city council election of 1977. And Michael, I wonder if you could kind of frame for us why, it's, why this is an important point in thinking about Richmond's, how Richmond sees itself and including how it thinks about the Civil War? Well, the 1977 election represents um, the moment when Richmond has its first Black majority on the city council, and as a result, its first Black mayor. Um, all of that came after city elections had been suspended for seven years because um, the white dominated city council in collusion with a neighboring county had um, carried out an annexation that was explicitly designed to dilute the black vote in Richmond um, and kneecap political power before it could gain full strength. So we have black political empowerment in Richmond, which um, probably represents um, a high watermark uh, um, for black people politically um, um, since the reconstruction era. And it, to live through it, and I was a very young man at the time, was to witness a level of, of resentment, of fear, of anger. I remember working in a department store where uh, one of my colleagues was railing about King Henry. That would have been Henry Marsh, Richmond's first black mayor. Um, editorially, the Richmond newspapers were railing against this new turn of events and predicting the worst. And, um, it was um, very traumatic 
um, for many people in white Richmond. Um, and those fears were manifest in the most curious way that there was fear that the monuments would come down, um, as was articulated in the film, which of course was greeted with laughter in the recollections of, of council members who said we had a lot more on our plate affecting, you know, people who were alive and <laughs> expecting things from us more tangible than the removal of the monuments at the time. Um, and I think there was also a level of um, pragmatism there that, you know, people who are taking power are not going to immediately focus on something that you know, at the time would be viewed as largely symbolic and be probably unwinnable. So, um, yeah, that's what the 1970s represented, um, just this, this sea change um, from which Richmond is still largely um, uh, influenced. Um, the city recently got the results of the, um, the census mm -hmm. that indicate that Richmond um, is no longer a majority Black city, nor even uh, a mostly Black city, that we now have a white plurality in Richmond. And, and, and that's kind of a big deal in the way we think about Richmond. And, and, and it has a lot of implications political and otherwise for the future. But um, it, it will be interesting to see what a Richmond that is less defined by 1977 in ways good and bad would look like. Um, I'd like to go back to uh, what Christy was saying Please about do. how the history was taught. I must say for most of my life, all of the, 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 the history that she articulated about enslavement and its dominant role in the Richmond economy was never discussed. I did not hear any, any of this. Slavery was the thing we did not speak of in Richmond um, for most of my life. And I'm old, but I'm not that old. Um, so it's like, it wasn't until a couple of decades ago that we could start discussing this deep, dark secret about the city. And I'm assuming that would also extend to people like one of your columns was about the, um, I think the, the, meta, the hospital is named after, could you explain a little bit about who the hospital is named after in Richmond? And- oh, um, um, uh, McGuire, McGuire yes. on the Veterans Administration Hospital. Yes. Um, Hunter Holmes McGuire, um, largely venerated here, was a um, racist, a eugenicist. Um, he um, was a Confederate um, Army surgeon um, who never really um, in any way disavowed white supremacy and spent seemingly most of his life trying to reinforce it. Um, I'm, I have advocated for the removal of that name from that hospital. It hadn't seemed to go anywhere. But I mean, if we're changing names of schools and removing statues, I don't know how Hunter Holmes McGuire gets a pass. He still has a monument at the state capitol, by the way. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the challenges there is that that is federal property. And in order to convince Virginians to allow these federal facilities here, they named them after Confederates. This is why we have Fort Lee and Fort Pickett and Fort this and Fort that and the McGuire Hospital. It was to, it was to placate white Virginians and their love affair with the Confederacy. And so the remnants of that even touched the federal government that we fought a war against this and yet they named these institutions after these people, which then gives validity a certain level of validity to those who want to venerate them. Well, the U.S. government recognizes that mm. they were, you know, heroes and they were just fighting for what they, but nonsense that it was all political. You want to spend money down here. We want you to spend money to get my folks to not be suspicious of these facilities. Hey, put, put one of our hero names on it. And we still have that, right? We still have that here in Virginia. Man, and there's just bunches of them. This all weaves together how, I mean, yeah. it shows how all these are really woven, to, woven together. Yeah. And the lack of logic of white supremacy that US soldiers are <laughs> being housed in forts named after men who slaughtered US soldiers. Yes, exactly. 
Um, Christy, you were the co-chair of the Monument Avenue Commission. Um, and that, um, that was appointed by Mayor LeVar Stoney in 2017. And the following year, you released a, um, a really important report, I believe that is, like, I believe that it was important about, it was uh, 117 pages, I think. Uh, it's very, it's, it's, a, I would, it's not necessarily easy reading, but it's important. And I think it also, rec and it also recommended the removal of the Jefferson Davis uh, monument. Um, could you, did, um, this is, a, I'm sure this was heavy lifting, um, but could you um, reflect on what that commission did and how its recommendations were received? Sure, so when it was announced in, in uh, I think it was June of 17, um, Michael Paul was there sitting in the front row, I think, uh, when it was announced and, um, and the, the, the mandate that we were given because state law said we could not recommend taking them down, it was, okay, what are we going to do with them, right? What, what are, what, you know, please study this, this issue, make a recommendation or recommendations to the city. And that's how we approached it. And of course, you know, it set off an immediate firestorm um, in the community, especially among the Confederate sympathetic. Um, it also set off a storm among people who, you know, well, why isn't taking them down an option, right? Um, and as a matter of fact, I remember that was one of the first questions my, uh, Michael Paul asked after the statements were read. And he said, well, why aren't you making taking them down an, an issue? And so as we began our process over the next several months, and I got to say, you know, it started off pretty rocky. But once we figured out um, the, the ways to approach it and to get as much feedback, public feedback as possible around the issues from everything from setting up uh, websites where the museums community and the, and the uh, educational communities in Richmond got together and provided documentation and essays and things like that to help the community learn about the real history of the statues in particular, but also the background around that. So there was a portal for that. There was a portal for people to submit their letters and statements so that we could track you know, sort of the trends. There were in-person meetings where people were allowed to speak. Our most successful meetings, honestly, were when we realized that we could do what we call the two by twos. Um, you know, and, and I, I'll be honest, it was, it was a way to get feedback without while allaying the fears that some organizations had about their our presence as, as commission members triggering um, Open Meetings Act. So we went two by two to varying, um, any organization could request us to come to council people, I mean, um, to commission members to come and meet with them to hear what they had to say. So we did that. And we also kept track of it though, of what we did. It, you know, when we did that, we didn't like have a silent, you know, we're not going to tell mm. people what happened. We kept notes of what happened in those meetings when we did two by twos. So when it was all said and done, we had thousands of responses. Um, we had um, education sessions for the city and so forth. So when it was all said and done, we gave four primary recommendations, one of which was take down Jefferson Davis as soon and as reasonably possible, legally possible, et cetera, because it is the most detrimental in terms of its lost cause um, Im imagery, as well as it's the actual language on the monument itself. Um, the other recommendation was align with artists to reinterpret and create new ways of thinking about how to add context or, uh, or, or shift meaning. Um, we also recommended that the city partner with other cities and communities across the state to lobby the legislature to allow for state, um, I'm sorry, to allow local control over the issue. And then um, we made recommendations about potential signage at, at them that would give this background in history that we had, had compiled. So those were the four big things that we did. And what was fascinating to me watching the summer of 2020 is all of those things happened by the people. The legislature did in fact, when, when the, the legislature, both houses and the governorship became democratic, and one of the first orders of business is that they um, allowed local control around monuments issues, right? 
So that was important. The, the street protesters and, and so forth took it upon themselves to recontextualize with artist renderings from graffiti art to um, dance and music to the projections that most of us saw to, I mean, it was really powerful imagery being created at all of those statues, particularly at the Marcus David Peters, which is another thing, taking meaning. You know, Marcus Davis Peters was basically, was this young man who was having a mental health crisis, was murdered by Richmond police. And so, you know, it was while George Floyd may have been a trigger for us locally, what happened to, to Mr. Peters was the real issue. And so renaming, I mean, it, it's, it's really, um, to me, amazing. And then there was a group of, of, of also uh, young protesters who put up history signs at each of them. I mean, they installed them themselves, created and installed them. I am so sorry, <laughs> uh, weirdness happens. Um, but anyway, so it, it became this like amazing thing. And, um, you know, and looking back at it, all of that, you know, really the, the people ultimately have always had the power. Mm. And I think the summer showed us what can happen if, you know, we, we find one excuse after another about why something can't happen that is, that is public will. The public has all of these avenues to make change. Kristen, what you just said is so rich. I want to go around and get, um, get Michael Paul and Lance and Hannah's response to that, too. Well, um... I think what happened in the summer of 2020 is what happens when a people's very reasonable requests are denied. You know, mm -hmm. you don't want to talk about removing monuments or giving localities control to remove the monuments. Um, you don't even want to allow context. There was resistance to the allowance of context. It should be noted by the party of Lincoln the Republican, which is, is, is just such a perversity. And, and you know, it, it trips me out how people don't understand how the scripts are flipped when it comes to politics in America. But uh, that was the new massive resistance. You cannot touch these statues. And you, you, OK, that'll work up to a point. And then the people are going to take matters into their own hands. And you don't have a thing to say about it. Because you know, that's what happens when people's reasonable requests and petitions to the government are denied. Michael so, Paul, you just mentioned my massive resistance. Can you just give people, it's just tell us what you're referring to. Um, that was um, the Virginia born political strategy to resist um, the desegregation of public schools after Brown versus Board of Education. Um, uh, the very, very slow walk. Um, the outright, outright resistance and the very, very slow walk to integrate the schools. So people, so white controlled school districts would prefer to close the schools. Oh, well, that's what happened in Prince Edward. To, in Prince Edward County. And I think that, so when you're making a comparison between refusal of, of even context, which I think is a very, very moderate, response to massive resistance. Mm -hmm. This is what I think people need to keep. The history is deep here. Lance and Hannah. Well, I think, you know, two things that history, that, that Christy brought up that, that I, I think are, are, you know, particularly important. She talks about the reclamation of what had been known as Robert E. Lee Circle, the circle on which the Robert E. Lee statue stands, uh, the reclamation of it by the people and renaming of it as Marcus David Peters Circle. There are images of that in the curriculum guide that we've produced as part of this film. And also the Monument Avenue Commission recommendations that Christy highlights, Those that, that portion of the commission report is also in this curriculum guide. In both cases, uh, along with many other primary sources that relate to the film, to direct and encourage students on how to unpack those and ask good questions of those. One of the people we uh, were grateful joined our team early on is uh, Rodney Robinson, who's the 2019 National Teacher of the Year yeah. and a 20-year veteran of Richmond Public Schools. 
and we invited him to write the curriculum for the film. It, one thing that, that has struck us in our work, and, and this especially goes back to, to an outrage, our film on the history and legacy of lynching that you mentioned in the introduction, uh, but before that with work we did with, uh, with teachers through the Gilder Lehrman Institute, documentary films can do very little on their own. No matter how earnest, no matter how much truth is, is within them, they have to be put to work if they're going to matter at all. After premiering and really upon the premiere of an outrage at the Smithsonian History Film Forum in 2017, we partnered with the Southern Poverty Law Center's Learning for Justice Project, who wrote a curriculum for that film and have been distributing it to their network of 500,000 teachers since then as a, as a way to teach the typically untaught history of lynching and racial violence in America. We knew that we wanted that educational component to be built into the very fabric of this film and the process of making it. And so the one thing that's exciting to me is that the, the sort of uh, it really important rich details of this history and this present that, that, that Christy is, is highlighting and drawing our attention to are part of how students will have the opportunity to engage with this film and, and with this history. And I really appreciate Christy's point about people power. Um, if there's one central theme of the film, it, it is that um, it is people power that generates change. And um, that, that was the through line that we wanted to, to create is to show that last summer was part of a continuation of generations of resistance and it's all built on each other and, and hopefully we can learn from uh, previous generations about how to um, keep pushing for for more for more justice and I think you know one thing that also points to is all of the demands from last summer that haven't been addressed and you know the, the film ends with kind of um zooming out a bit and, and talking about how you know we're talking about the lens of the monuments but um what are the, all the other um symbols of, of white supremacy that are still very much present in our city and what needs to be done to dismantle those um i'd like to recommend people to take a look at the curriculum guide i think sometimes people think oh curriculum guides are for teachers and and but I find them extraordinarily rich and good to help you think through imagery and um, some of the ideas. Um, unfortunately, we're coming toward our end of our time. So my I'm going to have a last question that'll go around for all of you is that um, and this is kind of the uh, just reflect on the relationship between Richmond, what people can learn about from um, the experience of Richmond, because this film is deeply grounded in place. But as we know that anti-Black, anti-Indigenous, racist, white supremacist monuments are, is a national phenomenon. What can people who might be sitting in a community where they feel troubled by the, the monumental presence or names, in uh, names of schools, names of teens, uh, mascots, et cetera, what can they learn from the Richmond's experience about how to think through these issues and act? Um, so Michael, Paul, I'd like to start with you. Well, I mean, I'll say in a minute that the Richmond experience in America is just fairly universal, that you can't really understand America unless you understand Richmond. And um, so these, Monuments, these school names, et cetera, were born out of extremely undemocratic impulses. And if you watched a film like, like Hannah and, Lan and Lance's, you see how destructive that can be. You can see the resistance, but you can also see how destructive these undemocratic impulses are. And you can't, you can't do better unless you know better. So, how do we respond to an infrastructure built out of a dearth of democracy? We're dem we'd be democratic. So I think the path forward is for us to, to rebuild and rename um, with a level of inclusion and people power that can undo the harm that this lack of democracy in the past uh, has left us with that legacy. 
Uh, Richmond has an opportunity moving forward to remake a street with a bunch of empty pedestals. It, it has an opportunity to finally tell the story of what happened in Shaco Bottom. Um, these are things we need to move forward with post haste, with popular, extremely people oriented involvement. Thank you, uh, Christy. What Michael Paul said, um, I, I think, honestly, the communities thinking about this, I, I also am a big believer is be grounded in, in fact, you know, whether that's going through the original documentation itself, not cherry picking, mm -hmm. but really looking at the breadth of the of what the, the historical record tells us. Um, and that I think should be a, a place of informing without necessarily dismissing, I'm not suggesting you're dismissing the emotional impact, but you have to be grounded in something. And so to ground oneself in the historical record to me is a place to start to understand and make these kinds of changes in one's own community. Thank you. Um, Hannah and Lance. I think what has stuck out to me is seeing everyone, seeing, seeing a, a critical mass of people each kind of bring their own expertise and skills and tools and background to bear on a single issue. And, and you know, the, the public historians kind of writing these signs and installing them, um, printing, you know, uh, pamphlets that provided more background information, um, you know, these lighting artists projecting on the statues. There were so many people who brought their own, um, their own skills to, to contribute, uh, teachers teaching this in school, um, parents and, and community um, members showing up at city council meetings. It takes that kind of um, activism, you know, in its many forms and, and people um, contributing, you know, in, in the ways that they can to really um, elevate the conversation to the point where it feels like, gosh, you, you can't miss it. It's no longer some marginalized thing that only a few people care about, but it's coming from so many different angles. And I think when we look at the resonance that this movement had last summer and that movements for change have had in Richmond for decades and generations, what we see is that even when there are flashpoints around monuments, most obviously last summer, that it's about something much bigger. Mm -hmm. the, the, the thing that is pulling people to make projections on monuments and demand transformative change it's not about statues and stone. It's about combating white supremacy. It's about actually realizing black liberation. That is the, the bigger cause and the bigger story and the bigger uh, necessary reality. And, and so even as a community like Richmond and others that have removed troublesome monuments can maybe feel a sense of pride and satisfaction of that to stop there would miss the larger point. Uh, th this is not what people last summer found as the, the end all be all of what they were demanding, nor is it what John Mitchell or Maggie Walker or any of the other people fighting for equality and liberation in Richmond have ever been asking for. Um, this is part of it, and this has often been part of it, that this being the, the removal of Confederate statues, but it is part of a much bigger story, and uh, we would do a disservice to that history and to those people who have demanded change in visionary ways to, to think that somehow removing stone uh, solves the problem. Thank you for this extraordinarily rich discussion. Um, I'd like to urge anyone watching this to definitely watch the documentary, How the Monuments Came Down. Um, check out some of the, um, the, check out the website, which has so many resources, including the monument, commission report and go to the Pulitzer site so you can read Michael Paul Williams. Um, really, they, they, I don't know how you do it in 900 words or under a thousand words of capturing so much history and, um, and also where people are and what could go forward. You can see how the monuments came down when it airs in September on PBS. Check out your local listings and when it streams on pbs.org beginning on September 8th, 8th, 2021. Lance Warren, Hannah Ayers, 
Christy Coleman, Michael Paul Williams, thank you so much for joining us and the, the Smithsonian Associates for this discussion.